Hey everyone, this is Zephyr, and welcome to the BailiWiki channel, where we teach everyday DMs how to create truly amazing experiences for their players by combining art and technology. If you're a DM who likes to wow your players and you're using platforms like Dungeon Draft and Foundry Virtual Tabletop, then you're in the right place. Today, we wanted to show you the ultimate automation suite for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition in Foundry VTT. This is a suite of add-on modules that take pretty minimal setup to give you incredible levels of automation. This handles complex effects such as on movement and over time and special summons with extra attacks very well. It makes it incredibly easy to just get going with your group of players after only a few minutes of setup and you're off to the races. Your combats will be snappier, easier to manage, and you can focus more on the narrative and the strategy of the battles rather than the bookkeeping. We'll first get started with a kind of general summary of the modules we're going to use, and then we'll go into the settings you need to go through before you get started. Next, we'll assemble characters and monsters, and finally, we'll demonstrate a little bit of a combat and how all of these different automations play together. Now, let's dive in. For the modules that we're going to be using today, we've got a pretty long list. Not all of them are required for automations. We do have things like 3D canvas and levels and a few other pieces to just elevate our experience. And we're using the BailiWiki modules to bring in all of these gorgeous maps that are in the background. That's actually part of our latest release that's available right now. In the description, there's going to be a detailed list of every module that we use today. And it's going to have the category that it fits under. For example, the MIDI QOL suite is going to be a section and there'll be a section on levels and 3D canvas and essentially what all of the different pieces do. So we're going to run through this really quickly, but remember to reference the description for a detailed and organized list of the categories. So first up, we have 3D canvas and its kind of companion modules, including the map making pack and the token collection and then 3D portraits for us to be able to use Hero Forge icons. Then we have active auras, active token effects. Those are going to help fuel our automation. Alternative pause icon is this little eye candy here down at the bottom. Argon is our HUD of choice. We have automated animations as well as FX master and token magic effects and JB2A. It doesn't matter whether you're using the free or the Patreon version of that, just one of those. Those will all add some eye candy. Relatedly, the D&D 5e animations module is going to allow you to bring in a bunch of preset animations for non-SRD content. Then we have some of the BaileyWiki modules and some quality of life features such as Carousel Combat Tracker to make our combat tracker really nice and pretty. That also fits in with Dice So Nice and Dice Tray. Furthering the automation, we have things like DFREDS, Convenient Effects, the whole MIDI QOL suite, which includes DAE, Item Macro, and then we have Effect Macro, Template Macro, etc. And we have Chris's Premades, which is kind of the glue that brings a lot of these things together. It leverages things that MIDI and DAE and a lot of these other macro modules can do and makes it really easy for us to bring in a bunch of automation at once. And that goes hand in hand with the D&D Beyond Importer from Mr. Primate. We've showcased this a few times in the past, but this is going to really show off how useful it is. Whether you're using D&D Beyond or not, it's super helpful to be able to bring in a bunch of the content from there, even if it's just SRD, with a lot of smart intelligence built into it. Rounding out the rest of this, we have some of Monk's pieces. We have Monk's active tau triggers and little details and scene navigation to help get around a lot. And then we have Monk's token bar for being able to manage tokens. And we're also going to be using that as an integration with MIDI. Some important choices that you have available to you. As we mentioned earlier, we have Argon Combat HUD from Ripper. And you can use any combat HUD you want. You can even forego a combat HUD, but it just makes combat significantly smoother and faster and easier for everyone involved. And we prefer Argon for 5e because it also breaks down your action economy and includes those base actions of, you know, dodge, dash, and disengage for newer players and veteran players alike. We also recommend Action Pact and, of course, the classic Token Action HUD. Just pick your favorite, but we highly recommend you have some form of Token HUD to use. Then, in terms of role support, we're using MIDI QOL, and that's going to be the backbone of our automation. One of the things for that is prompting players to roll saves and other roles. 
There's two ways to do that. You can use let me roll that for you, which at the time of this recording works in version 11, but is not technically approved for version 11. So it needs an update and there may be some bugs with it. Or you can use Monk's token bar to request the rolls. Then for cover calculations, such as half cover, full cover, etc., then you can either choose to use symbols automatic cover calculator or the levels automatic cover calculator. Since we're patrons of Rippers and we are leveraging levels, we're going to go ahead and use the levels automatic cover calculator. Relatedly, if you are using levels and you're a patron of Rippers, we highly recommend you grab the levels volumetric templates. Ripper recently also integrated Patreon with all of his modules, so you can download them directly from the module browser, which makes keeping up with all of these great little pieces that he has much easier. Finally, there's an important note that with Chris's pre-mains, you do not want to use the dynamic active effects SRD module or the MIDIQL SRD module. Chris's pre-mains incorporates a lot of those features into the module itself and will actually produce errors for you if you use them together. Rounding some things out, we also have Simple Counter, which is a MIDI QOL requirement, but we're gonna show off a few nice things about that for your game. And then we're also gonna show off Small Time, which allows you to manage time a little bit more effectively. It's not strictly combat related, but it can help with managing certain lasting effects. With all of the modules out of the way, let's dive into settings. When you first activate all of the modules, you should get a pop-up for the D&D 5e animations update menu, unless you've already been leveraging that with automated animations. This is basically telling you all of the different effects that's going to bring in and add to your automated animations menu. And this won't overwrite things that you already have entries for. For example, if you already brought in something that was like acid arrow, it shouldn't overwrite that. To be safe though, you can go into configure settings and go to automated animations and launch its main menu. Then in the menu manager, you can export your menu to a JSON file, and then later you can merge it back in so that it does not get overwritten and you don't lose any special animations you've already set up and spent time on. But this is gonna add all of these different pieces. And when you're ready, you just go ahead and click update. And from there, it's going to fill out your automatic recognition menu here for you. And if for whatever reason this didn't pop up when you first started, you'll go ahead and hit the update menu down here in your settings. And in this case, we just updated, so no updates were found. But if you had not clicked that yet, you would have the options for all these updates. Similarly, if for whatever reason you've really mucked up all your settings, you can do the menu manager to restore default menu and get rid of everything. And then you can re-import through this update menu for all the D&D 5e animations. And a nice feature of that is if you're using 3D Canvas, you'll notice that if we go into automated animations and we look at 3D Canvas, these are also set up for all of these entries that came in from the D&D 5e animations menu. For settings, the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to go into MIDI QOL. And then we're going to make sure that this enable role automation support is enabled. We need that for Chris's pre-mades to hook in properly. Next, we're going to open our workflow settings and we're going to go to quick settings. And this is basically where everyone should start when you're using MIDI QOL. There's a lot of settings here and it can be very intimidating and there's a lot of fine tuning you can do, but just pick a quick setting that describes what you want the best and start from there. We highly recommend fall automation, especially if you're trying to make things snappy and quick. It's very smooth and very painless. And then you can make adjustments as you go. So we're going to start with that. And it'll tell you all of the changes that are made whenever you select a preset. So we'll go ahead and hit apply changes. And that will also check some of these settings down here. Next, we'll go back to the workflow settings and workflow itself. You want to go down to the save section. And then in the prompt players to roll saves, you want to change that to whatever module you're using, whether that's let me roll that for you or monk's token bar. There's also some other options if you would prefer or accommodations with let me roll that for you but just pick the one that's most appropriate for you and your group. Next, we're gonna go into the MISC section. We need to make sure that we have this add actor on use macro to sheet and add item on use macro to sheet. These are also important for our automation. Then we also need to make sure that the merge rolls to one card is ticked. This should be ticked by default if you selected that full automation, but just make sure that it is. Next, we'll go into mechanics and you wanna make sure that you set 
this up down here, which is the effect when HP equals zero. MidiQL will give you errors if you don't. You're gonna have different behaviors for player controlled versus GM controlled. For example, generally speaking, players are gonna be unconscious. And if a GM controlled token dies, it's gonna be dead for zero HP. It doesn't matter what you choose there. And you can either do add effect as only an overlay or as an icon or don't update, whatever you wanna do. Just make sure that you have this filled out. Then we want to go down to the check weapon range when attacking section. This is kind of a section about just how AC and calculating things works. And the main thing we wanna do is we wanna look at walls block ranged attacks. And here you wanna choose the appropriate cover setting that you have. For example, we're using levels auto cover, so we're gonna select that. And this is important because then you're actually using how levels auto cover calculates things. As opposed to the center check, it's just gonna look center on center, one line between the tokens. Can they see the center of each other? The levels auto cover actually looks at sight lines and then dynamically calculates things out. So you actually can get things like half cover and three quarters cover versus just full cover or half cover or no cover. Then for calculate cover, you need to also select your appropriate module. Again, we're using levels auto cover, but you could use symbols or alternative token visibility as well. Then that's everything we need in the MISC and mechanics sections. From here, you can choose whether you want to make additional changes here. For example, this rule section is a good one to check out because there are a lot of optional game rules about flanking, et cetera, or hiding people, house rules, having different margins on things. And this is a really good place to mess around with because this is all the optional pieces and you're not necessarily going to really complicate how your automation is going. Beyond that, if you want to alter things such as more of the attack formula or how reactions work or concentration, et cetera, feel free to go through these. It can be a little overwhelming, so don't feel like you need to. If you are wanting to dive more into MIDI-QOL and you're feeling intimidated, don't worry. We have an interview series with Tim Posney, the creator of MIDI-QOL, who goes through MIDI and all of his modules to kind of explain how they work and break down kind of your first ports of call for that. Additionally, Tim has a Discord that we'll link in the description. It's full of helpful folks for all things MIDI and automation and foundry in general. It's a great resource. Definitely check it out if you're looking for further tips on automation, whether that's tweaking things to your own liking or developing your own automation for some of your effects. After MIDI QOL, the next things we're gonna go to are the levels automatic cover calculator. And the first thing you need to do is make sure you have the library mode checked. It should tick automatically, but just to be safe, make sure you do that. And then I would suggest either removing the tokens provide cover or making sure to have the ignore tokens of the same disposition ticked on. Reason being is that particularly if you're using summons and some of the very niche summons that have you making attacks from your character that actually come from the token, that can cause some strangeness with cover calculation and Chris's premades. So just keep those two settings in mind. You can also adjust some of these other settings if you would like, but those are the only really important ones that I think you need to make sure to take a look at. After the automatic cover calculator, we need to take a look at item macro and you just need to make sure that this character sheet hook setting is off. You can check all these other settings according to your personal preference, but make sure that this one is not selected. Then we need to go into Chris's premades. And there's a lot of different settings for Chris's premades, and it can be a little daunting at first. The really big one you want to start with is module integration. And this is basically saying whether you want to have these different modules be supported. Big things are going to be the D&D 5e animation sounds. I would highly recommend that you check that. And same thing with the Dice So Nice compatibility, assuming you're using that. These other colorize options will show off in a moment, but they're really helpful for looking at a glance to see, okay, do I have my automation good to go, period? Then I like having those ticked on because I can see it really easily. There's some other options in here if you would like, and some of them are dependent upon you having different modules enabled. There's also the homebrew section, and the homebrew section has some special rules in it that you might consider adding in, such as the ranged or unarmed divine strikes and how magic missile is rolled. So take a look at those. These other features, you'll notice if you go into your compendiums and you open Chris's premades, 
and you look at different things. For example, if we drill down into the equipment and wonder item, we look at boots of element kind. The descriptions on Chris's pre-made items or feats or class features or spells, etc., are always going to tell you if there's any settings that need to be enabled or anything that needs to be brought in. So, for example, a creature that needs to be in your sidebar and if it's safe to rename. Chris's pre-mades checks some things against name, some to start with just to see if, okay, we have a match for this, and then others, it will need to check that name every single time that you use the effect. And that is when it is not safe to rename. So pay attention to that. For these, you could easily just drop these on someone and say, okay, these are Gomer's shoes or whatever, after you have it set up, not a problem. But this says that it requires the skill patching setting to be enabled. So for that, make sure you go to your Chris's pre-made settings. And then in general, that's where some of these broader effects are. And you can look down there and then you have the skill patching and it's got a brief description of what it does, allowing certain macros to modify your skill checks. Most of these aren't gonna be ticked by default. So if you have an issue with your automation, then make sure to come in here and check what is going on. Similarly, there are other pieces in here like spells and feats and class features where you can open these up for specific automations. For example, a booming blade ticked right now, and that will power the booming blade automation. Similarly, I would generally recommend that you do these one at a time rather than doing them in bulk, but use your own judgment on that. Especially if you already glance at this, you know you're not going to be diving into someone else's automation of it. You're going to just be using the Chris's pre-made one, and you know you're gonna be using most of these. Then fair enough. Next, since we're in the neighborhood, we need to go to the D&D Beyond Importer. The big thing here is the core setup. Core setup has two really big things, and that is your Cobalt cookie. This is absolutely required in order to be able to use the D&D Beyond Importer. Mr. Primate on the GitHub has instructions, and there's also a link to follow manual steps for being able to grab your Cobalt cookie. It's basically, it's almost like your password for D&D Beyond. It stores all the information about what products you actually own and what content you can access. So you need to have that to be able to import things. You also, if you are a patron, you should go ahead and put in your detect Patreon status. If you click on this, it will open another web page for you to log into your Patreon and authenticate it. And if not, there's steps for putting in a key to make sure you have your Patreon verified. So make sure you have those filled in. After D&D Beyond is squared away, let's take a look at two other modules that you can just leave alone, but they add a lot if you do a little bit of work with them. So Simple Calendar is the thing that adds a game clock in the background, and it's part of the time that MIDIQL uses to track effects. For example, if something has a 10 minute effect, then it is going to use Simple Calendar's game clock to determine when that effect elapses. There's another module called Times Up that we have installed. It's a MIDIQL requirement that will have things time out based upon combat time. But with Simple Calendar, you can just leave it as is, or you can use the buttons to bring it up. And you can also open up this configuration. And there's quick setup for if you're using one of the really popular settings, chances are their calendar is in here. And if it's not, then you can actually go through and you can rename your weekdays and months and set up your lunar calendars and all of those good things. So you can dive really head deep into the world building. And Small Time really helps with integrating that. Small time introduces a little widget here. It is small and it controls the time. You can advance the time in chunks, which again is helpful for adjudicating. You know, you are having a conversation with an NPC for a while, but we're not actually using real time to represent that conversation. So you might need to advance it 20 minutes based on the conversation or the role playing going on there. You can adjust these step amounts to whatever you want, both large and small, and then settings that are Pretty impactful here are synchronizing sunrise and sunset, and that's gonna link it up to your calendar. So then, you know, in the winter you have shorter days, in the summer you have longer days. And then whether these affect the scene darkness and whether the moon phase affects darkness as well and how much that impacts. I would suggest turning these on immediately if you are really interested in these features. If not, don't worry. Even though it says that uh, only applies to new scenes, it does also mention that you can change these settings in the scene config by going to the lighting section and then under small time, you can adjust that as well. It's also useful for determining whether there's global vision or not on a scene. 
after setting up your calendars and time management, everything else is kind of personal preference, except for our final core setting. So if we go into core, we need to open up our permission configuration, and we need to add some extra permissions to our players. If your players are all trusted, then you can go off of this column. But assuming any of them are using the regular player, you need to make sure you have these three settings enabled for warp gate. You need to have configure token settings, create new tokens, and use the file browser. These are all things that warp gate, which helps manage summonings and other effects, it allows it to actually fire when a player uses one of those abilities. So make sure you add that in and save. One important thing to note here, if you get tripped up on some of these settings, MidiQL has a pretty handy troubleshooter. It's in early development, so this is not going to be a end-all be-all source of figuring out what your woes are, but it has some helpful features. For example, you've got a summary of different settings, including important things for being able to figure out like, okay, roll separate attacks per target is set to false. That is also an important setting for Chris's premates. So you can use this to double check what settings you have that can have major impacts on your automation and how it works. You've got a list of common modules that are used with it. And then the problems section can be really helpful for finding these large masthead issues. For example, if we were to go back to our core and we did not have configure token settings enabled and we went back to the MIDI section and under problems, you'll notice that now there's a warning for warp gate that players don't have permission to configure tokens. So this can help you find those big issues that are a quick fix, but can be hard to find sometimes just because they're easy to overlook just in the settings. So keep that in your back pocket if you're running into issues. After configuring those permissions and familiarizing yourself with the different settings for MIDI qual and Chris's premades, everything else is pretty much up to your discretion and personal taste on what you want to tweak. So feel free to poke around in all of these modules, but that concludes the things that we think are strictly necessary to configure before getting started. And speaking of getting started, with our settings all configured, our modules all enabled, it is time for us to start fulfilling our automation dreams, and we're gonna do that first by importing a character from D&D Beyond from scratch. What better place for a character to start their journey than this beautiful airship dock, which is again, a part of the latest BaileyWiki release that you can grab on our Patreon right now. So to create a new character for D&D Beyond, you simply need to create an actor or create them from your folder. I've got a player characters folder here and their name literally does not matter because it's going to be overwritten by the D&D Beyond section. If you don't recognize this sheet, this is the tidy 5e sheet, which is one of the modules we installed. When you install it and activate it by default, that's gonna be your default sheet. You can configure that and there's different ones for NPCs versus player characters. So you can adjust that at your discretion. Once we have that, then we're gonna go ahead and click on this D&D Beyond button next to the name. And this is where we are going to put in the URL for our character. So if we just go to our player character on D&D Beyond, make sure you grab the whole link, copy that, and then go back to Foundry, we can paste that in at the top. And with this URL, you can see it's green, so that's a character right there. And now we're going to have some selections to make. All of these update things, generally speaking, you can leave them by default. This is what's going to come in. You can also use D&D Beyond in order to update something as you go. So you can choose whether to exclude certain categories of things. If you know, like, we're keeping track of currency only in Foundry, I do not care about what it is in D&D Beyond, and I don't want to overwrite it, then you would untick that, etc. Then again, I would generally leave these things the same and you can choose whether to use icons from the SRD compendium or just leave them to be imported from D&D Beyond. Next, for companions, for example, if you have a lot of summonings, you'll need to import the character and then import again to bring in the companions. If you are a patron of Mr. Primates, you can update back to D&D Beyond. So you can use this to send these different categories back to D&D Beyond. And the important part for our purposes is the active effects tab. For this, this is generating effects for equipment, spells, features, etc. And then we also have the option for Chris's premades module. You can easily just hit the apply recommended active effect settings. And you can see all these green dots are the required modules that we need. And we've got green across the board, so that's good. And then we're gonna go ahead and tick Chris's premades, and that's gonna fill in any of the gaps here for the most part. The last thing is maybe you wanna review the advanced setting. I don't really worry too much about how these are being replaced, but down here at the bottom, your players can add their own Cobalt cookies and Patreon keys for Mr. Primate if they are using separate resources from you. When that's all squared away, go ahead and go to the 
import characters section and hit start import. By default, it's gonna prompt you for resources if this character has a variety of resources. For example, this Tentacle of the Deeps is a Fathomless Warlock feature that has a limited number of uses and it's gonna go on my resource bar. I'm just choosing where it goes. I'm happy with leaving it at the default. And now we have our character all brought in and we'll notice that our attributes are in and our proficiencies are in. Everything is good to go. The only thing is we don't have artwork, but that's because we didn't have it on D&D Beyond. So I'm going to update Ventress and be right back. All right, now Ventress is in here and we're looking good. So let's take a quick little tour. So we have all of our inventory from D&D Beyond. Note that if you didn't have things equipped, you probably need to adjust that for your character sheet here. And one of the reasons why we like the Tidy 5e sheet is if you go back to this main page, your favorites will show up there. So you can have a quick access, but that's also why we have a token hut. In terms of equipment, he doesn't have any crazy magical items, so there's not actually a lot that's going to be added here. You'll notice that this is colorized thanks to that setting from Chris's pre-mades, and it indicates that we do have an automated animation ready to go for that particular piece. If we go to our spell book though, then we can actually see Chris's pre-mades in action. If we edit the item, we can see that we have the green icon for this med pack. This means that there was an automation and it's linked. And if you go ahead and left click it, you have the option to update or replace it. And then you have the option to configure it. If I say update replace, this isn't going to functionally change this at all because we brought it in from Chris's premades. But if you hit yes, it does tell you what it needs enabled in the settings for it to work. So if there's anything that you replace or you add, it will tell you beforehand. And basically Chris's premades in the compendium is going to have that in this information, but it's also cross-referencing it with things for the SRD that do have full description. So it will fill that in. Then the configure option is going to have different numbers of options and different kinds of options, depending upon the type of effect you're dealing with here. So in this instance, the booming blade only has the option for different colors of animation, but you can configure that as well. And then automated animations is not on here because the booming blade automation itself is going to kind of take over from automated animations. So there's that. And you can review this with Eldritch Blast, etc. And you can also see the DAE is colorized here. And that is actually a default DAE setting, just indicating that there is DAE here and you can modify things at your leisure. But this is a quick way to look at a glance and tell what's automated and what's not. If we head over to the feature section, we can also check out any additional automation that's here. So if you want to look at, say, the Tentacle of the Deeps, we can see that there is a Chris's pre-made setup for it. And for this one, you can see an example of a slightly larger bit of configuration. So here you can put in file paths for custom tokens and avatars if they're going to end up in the combat tracker. Don't worry about that if they're not. And then a custom name if you have one in mind. If you're not sure if something should have an automation, for example, we have Steady Aim does have the DAE here, but if for whatever reason you weren't sure, you didn't have something colorized and you couldn't see, then there is a really handy resource that's actually available in the form of the MIDI Qual Wiki here. This has been put together by Motomoto and I think some community collaborators, but there are a few different pre-mades lists here. And this breaks down where you can get automation for it. There is a code up here at the top for the different suites, and then a little breakdown up at the top with the legend for what each of those stand for. For example, the uh, Posny's Items and Script Showcase is a channel within Tim's Discord, and that's linked right here as well. And then you can see what covers these different features here. So you can scroll down and you can look over to the side, or you can use the search function with Control F to find it, and you can see what's covered. So an important thing here is Chris's premades and MIDI SRD actually conflict. You'll notice in the vast majority of cases that MIDI SRD and CPR actually are both in the same column, or if something's only in the MIDI SRD, then there's usually something in another column that takes care of it. So again, don't run MIDI SRD with CPR. CPR rolls it in and conflicts. So just stick to the other columns and ignore the MIDI SRD column in terms of figuring out what's got automation and what doesn't. Having done a quick tour of the character sheet to make sure everything looks good and you familiarize yourself with the different controls, let's go ahead and test things out. I'm going to go ahead and drop in Ventress here. And there is his token. 
and we'll go ahead and give him an enemy of a bandit. So to show off some of these features, we're gonna go ahead and open up this Argon Combat HUD as that's our Combat HUD of choice today. With Argon, if for whatever reason you don't have a weapon down here, just go to your sheet and make sure you drag it into one of these options here and then just open and close Argon and make sure to click on that and you should be good to go. So to show off some things, I'm going to give this bandit a lot of health because he's going to be a bit of a punching bag. And let's test out the booming blade interaction. One of the things with MIDI qual is you have this option to force targets with the full automation suite. So even though I haven't selected this bandit already, I'm going to click on him to target it. And we can also see that the levels calculator here has the no cover option. And we'll see that Booming Blade automatically used my rapier and it dealt the damage and everything great for me. Let's see what happens if we have multiple viable weapons equipped. Now, if I attempt to use Booming Blade, we choose between what equipped weapons we have. So if you're main handing a rapier and off handing a dagger for whatever reason you want to use the off hand, you have that option as well. And again, on target, the levels auto cover calculator is going to give you a message in the chat. And then let's check out what summons look like. If I attempt to use this tentacle summon of the deep, it's going to tell me this automation requires the following sidebar actors. Sidebar actors are used by CPR as templates for creating different summons. So we need the spectral tentacle. If we go into our companion packs for Chris's premades, then under the actor section, we've got CPR summons. You can optionally bring in all of these if you know you're going to use all of them. But for my case, we're just going to bring in the spectral tentacle. And don't worry about the spectral tentacle having a placeholder image. It's all going to be generated from that configuration. So when we go to use this, we'll use the ability and we get this nice little preview. So now I've added this and you can see with visual effects indicators that I have a way to get rid of this up here. I can end it at will. And then I've got my tentacle buddy hanging out here. Now I'm going to go ahead and attack this bandit with the tentacle of the deeps attack. And we'll notice that the tentacle of the deeps ability is one going to be down here under this section tentacle of the deeps. One of the modules that we're leveraging is custom character sheet sections. And you can basically just add text down here to create individual categories so that you can organize your sheets more deeply. Instead of it just being a passive ability or an active ability, it's going to be specifically the tentacle of the deeps ability. We can then copy and paste that so that then our summon and our attack are always going to be together. But reviewing how the ability works, Basically, we can create a tentacle at a point we can see, and then we can make an attack with it as a melee spell attack, and as a bonus action on subsequent turns, we can move it and keep attacking, and it does a d8 of cold damage, and then it also slows people down. So when we look at this, this went ahead and rolled the melee spell attack. Our spellcasting ability modifier is 7, and it applied cold damage. And if we look at this here, Bandit, we can see that the Bandit has a temporary effect of six seconds because it's the duration of a round. And if you want to open him up and look at the effects, we can see that this is reducing his movement. So it all works beautifully. And the only thing we had to do was put in a file path for the token and it's ready to go. There's one other thing to note though, that you'll see that it says we have plus two AC cover here. And this is why I was recommending we either turn off tokens causing collision or we turn on allied. Because Chris's premades doesn't automatically know what disposition the token is going to be when you summon it. It has all of them set to neutral because your enemies may also summon fairies or woodland creatures or something. So you may want those to be neutral. But for this, how Chris Premades is doing this attack, it's coming from Ventress, but then Chris Premades is changing the location that Ventress is attacking from to wherever the tentacle is to then calculate cover, which is all well and good. However, the tentacle is listed as neutral by default meaning that it's going to assume half cover because we have the whole tokens create cover. If you double right click on this and you change them to friendly and we make this attack again, you're able to successfully attack and not get the cover penalty. So if you know for a fact that only your player characters are going to be using this tentacle from the deeps or only your enemies are, then what you can do is you can come into the sidebar character and on the prototype token, change the token disposition to friendly. And the same logic applies for if 
only enemies are going to be used a certain summon and you're positive of that, then you can make them hostile and then you'll avoid the cover situation. Or again, just disable the whole tokens cause cover. But I wanted to call that out because it was something that was very confusing for a little bit until I spent some time figuring it out. But there you go. This is actually a somewhat complex character to automate in terms of going through all of their abilities. Even though they don't have a very expansive spell book, they still have a lot going on. And for example, if I attack with my rapier and I'm a swashbuckler, it's going to even ask me, do I want to use sneak attack? And I can choose to say yes to that. And then I will just automatically add my sneak attack. So there's a lot of different pieces here that would be kind of a pain to set up um, if you were going through all of these individually. And it has been done in a matter of seconds once I had all of my things set up. So this is a great way for your players to have those interesting builds, those complex effects, and be able to use them very smoothly in combat because we know what the abilities do, but sometimes the bookkeeping of counting out how many dice you're going to use can be a little much or making sure that when you have a larger party of say six people, you can keep track of, oh, this guy is slowed still for this turn or that guy has disadvantage. It's all being automatically applied for you and it's really easy. Again, with the booming blade, if I attack, then it's going to, again, give me the option to sneak attack. And we'll even see that this guy has the booming blade effect on him. So if he moves, he's going to get the question to the bandit move willingly and he did yes. So it's going to automatically apply booming blade. There's a lot of different things here that uh, again, while players understand how they work, you understand how they work. It can be wonderfully freeing to no longer have to micromanage and keep all kinds of notes or have to remember everything that's going on and you can focus on the narrative and story of the combat instead. And so that's really the power here. Next, we're going to go ahead and dive into updating some characters, whether we brought them in without automation earlier or we already brought them in with some automation and we're going to be overhauling them for Chris's premates. Now that we've brought in a brand new character, let's take a look at updating a older one. We're going to start with my friend Gomer here. And this guy is an artificer and he was brought in with D&D Beyond. However, we did not enable any of the automations for this. So absolutely nothing is automated. You can see that he too has booming blade, but this is showing yellow. You can update individual items by clicking on this and hitting update replace. And then when it's done, you'll notice that now it's green and it should be working as intended. But when you've got this expansive of a character, if you brought it in with D&D Beyond, what I would just recommend doing is clicking D&D Beyond and we're gonna go ahead and basically update this guy. So. You don't need to bring in any extras. We're not going to update D&D &D Beyond. We're going to go ahead and make sure all of our active effects are selected here. We don't need to use. We'll actually select not to display this resource dialog because we want to keep it the way it is. And then things that we need to change. We can honestly get rid of name, HP, hit dice, bio, languages, and just stick to the actual meat and potatoes here. And then if we start import, we can go ahead and take a look at the spellbook now. And this new booming blade has been properly automated. You can also see this magic missile, which we didn't touch earlier, has the automation, and it is good to go. With the green color, you'll also notice that there are some that say DAE, and these are automated pieces. And you can go ahead and edit these if you would like to, but for the most part, you can leave those alone. And basically, if you see the green bar up at the top, that means it's got an automation that's already been set up for you and it is ready to roll. So now this character is also perfect and ready for action. So we will test him out in a combat later. For a simpler character, or one that we know already has the other automations, for example, if we already had DAE, MIDI Qual, and the like from D&D Beyond, but we didn't have Chris's pre-made yet, the update process is even more simple. We can take this Barbarian from Hell that Colby designed at the D4 network, and then Joby actually showed us how to create in Foundry in his video earlier this month. Within this, he already brought in with all of the automation, and then he updated Armor of Agathus 
to use Chris's pre-mades instead of just the default automation that's brought in from D&D Beyond. But we've already got the DAE and the MIDI, et cetera, automation on here. We just need to get the Chris's pre-mades in. And we can even see if we scroll down here to the Genie's Wrath that there is an automation available for Chris's pre-mades. Rather than going through and checking every single one to see if it has a Chris's pre-made integration, you can also click up here on the character sheet to click the medical bag here for Chris's pre-mades, and then this will just apply all of the automations. We select yes, the actor update is complete. And it's also going to let us know what was updated. So we have Armor of Agathus, the Genie's Vessel, and Rage. All of those have now been set up for use with Chris's pre-mates. We even see that for any of these particular animations that we want to customize and those nice green dots there. So we are all ready to rock. The final piece of setting up your game's automation before you actually start running combats is of course setting up your enemies. There's a few different options for this. Since your players are so heavily automated, you could easily just use the regular MIDI qual handling of saving throws and damage applications and hit checks and just deal with the rest as it comes. But if you want it fully automated, then maybe you pick and choose on specific enemies, the more complicated ones that have those extra effects and do them as you come. You can open up and use the Chris's pre-mades option in order to apply all of the automations you have available for it. Or you can go through and you can manually select these to update and configure them or bring in the actions from the side. The latter may be particularly useful if you're homebrewing creatures and just stacking different features on something. But if you want to have a nice large library of fully automated creatures ready to go in your compendiums, then we'll need to turn to the D&D Beyond Muncher. Now to use this, you do have to be a patron of Mr. Primates in order to bring in all of these things. But if you hit the muncher, you can then select this Use Effects from Chris's Premades module. This is going to help bring in everything else and tie it all together. Then you can optionally include any of these other pieces. So from there, you'll first need to actually bring in spells rather than bringing in monsters. Seems a little counterintuitive, but since the monsters reference the spells and some of the features, we'll need to go ahead and do that. So go ahead and spell munch. This is gonna bring in all of the spells that you have on D&D Beyond, and it can take some time. I don't even have that much content on D&D Beyond, but it can add up. So maybe set aside a little chunk of time where you're not gonna to need to be actively working on your world for this. When you're done importing your spells, it'll tell you that it's finished and we can move on to the monsters. From here, you can now go ahead and select any additional options you want. For example, if you want them to retain biographies or you want to change artwork, etc., you can make those selections there. And then finally, when you're ready, we can go ahead and monster munch. And this is going to similarly take a good chunk of time as it's going to bring in all of those monsters for you. When you've completed munching your monsters, you can go into this D&D Beyond folder here, and we can see all of the monsters in here, and you can search for them, etc. So I can bring in this Azur, for example, and he's not going to look quite the same as these other guys, but here we are. And now he actually has all of his different pieces automated with DAE or with Chris's pre-mades depending. So, and we can compare that to his original buddies and they're not quite as automated here. So you can use that to update things and a reminder that you'll need to go in and replace any of these that you've already placed into your maps. Additionally, with that munching, you're gonna have a bunch of spells in your DDP spells folder. Some of this is a little redundant as you already have a bunch of them in your CPR folders and you're already going to be applying those and you're already using D&D Beyond Importer to bring in your characters, but if you're going to be slapping them onto people, this can be helpful. Now that we have our player characters and our enemies, let's go ahead and run a combat. So we've got Ventress and Gomer here with some bandits and a bandit captain. We'll go ahead and toggle the combat state as we would normally with Foundry. Then we've got our beautiful combat carousel here. And we can use that to roll all instead of having to open up our combat section. 
and we're going through here and we've got our initiative determined and now we can just hit the play button over here to start the combat off. Our bandit captain can go first and attack with his scimitar towards Gomer. And since he's got multi-attack, he'll go ahead and do those as well. And then we can just pass the turn with this convenient button right here on Argon. It's a common feature on a lot of different HUDs, but it's really nice to have. Then we've got Gomer, and Gomer has a whole lot of stuff going on over here. He is a artificer that has Thunder Gauntlets that on a punch will cause disadvantage on attacks against anyone but him. So if he moves over here and helps out Ventress a bit, go ahead and punch this guy. And of course, sometimes people just die, and that's that. As an artificer, he also has two attacks. So we are going to go ahead and smack another guy as well. And we can see that this bandit captain has the ability to parry. So it's going to prompt us for this reaction. If this roll was reversed, it would also prompt the player to use that reaction if they had one. So we can go ahead and do that. Unfortunately, it's not enough for the bandit captain. And the turn and Ventress can take his movement over here. And another convenient part of Argon is it's keeping track of how many squares we've moved. So another handy thing for reducing bookkeeping. And we'll do our classic booming blade. And no sneak attack required on this one. But maybe we'll go ahead and summon a tentacle of the deeps. And since we can attack at the same time, we'll notice this one is friendly, so we shouldn't have any cover issues. We can go ahead and attack. This bandit captain's already used his reaction. We can set up some further automations for that, but it can be useful to keep track of separately. So now this bandit captain is in all sorts of pain. And for the captain to demonstrate the power of the thunder gauntlets, he'll go ahead and try to take a couple of swings at Ventress. And we can see that he rolled with disadvantage. Fortunately, still getting in a hit, but that's no concern here. We've got all of these beautiful animations playing as well, which is another great feature of having the automated animations module. To bring that home, why don't we go ahead and cast a spell and show what that looks like. So we've cast as spells, we've run our combat really nice and beautifully. And if we end the turn, we remove those templates, although they're already automatically removed. We've gone ahead and used some pretty complex abilities, actually. We've done reaction pieces. We've done a booming blade ability that's actually been adjudicated with the movement and thunder gauntlets, adding the disadvantage automatically on not one but two attacks, although they didn't help in this case. And we've summoned a really cool, creepy eyeball tentacle here to assist in our battle. And this was really fast. Yes, there would have been player decision making here, but it is still so much faster than if we're going through manually. And I think that's the beauty of having this level of automation here. But let's take one more look at all of this great automation in another setting. Another great feature about this setup is that it even works incredibly in 3D. We've got a much tougher opponent for our heroes here. So we'll go ahead and add them to combat, roll everybody's initiative, and see how they fare. You can see there's also a really nice hover distance ability here. I have everyone selected, so it's a little convoluted. But I can see exactly how far away someone is. For example, center on center is 30.4 feet to get to the Baylor and I can drag around and see how far everyone is with 3D Canvas. When I'm ready, I can go ahead and make my target, and I am going to actually use a bonus action here and show off another really great integration, and that's going to be the Hex Spell. And this actually asks me what ability I should give him disadvantage on. He seems pretty tough, but maybe we can outmaneuver him, so we'll choose Dexterity also got these fantastic spell effects. 
and of course we'll use our classic booming blade with the rapier. And we'll use sneak attack because we are washbuckler and we get to do that for free. And you can see we have all of our damage calculated in here and you can look at how this is broken up. So it's really easy to run a combat with this particular setup. Again, Swashbuckler, Rackish, Audacity, Silliness, we can take a few steps back even and not provoke an attack of opportunity. But that might not be enough to save poor Ventress here. It's now the Baylor's turn and he's going to take a step forward to attack Ventress. And it's very simple to just hit T to target or wait until after we've determined the attack to go. And wow, lucky break for Ventress here. But he doesn't have too many chances for this. And that is a big hit. You can see there's glorious animations even in the 3D here. And we'll finish off with our whip here. Wow, very lucky breaks here for Ventress. Grimmer's turn will demonstrate a really beautiful integration of Magic Missile. So if we cast Magic Missile and we even upcast it, we can select as many targets as we want. So we'll go ahead and even though it doesn't really make sense, to hold Shift and T as you do it, and you cast the spell, we can then assign how many darts are going where. So we're gonna send four at the Baylor and zero at Ventress, just to demonstrate that you can have the multiple targets and you can show where they're going. Now the animation here is going to shoot at all targets regardless, but it's pretty neat to see it going through in all of those directions. And that's going to include our technical demonstration and our tutorial on this ultimate automation suite for D&D 5e on Foundry VTT. You'll just have to wonder on if Gomer and Ventress managed to make it out of this one. I hope that this has shown you how easy it can be to introduce an incredible amount of automation to your 5e game on Foundry. It may seem a little intimidating with the amount of modules at first, but really in terms of setup, it's not a lot that you actually need to do on an individual basis. Once you get it set up, you're more or less on fire and forget mode, and it makes your combats smoother, snappier, and also visually stunning without you having to do as much bookkeeping as a GM or as a player. And this allows us to focus more on the tactics and strategy of combat and the role playing and the descriptions and narrative of the combat rather than having to bookkeep things as much. This level of automation may not be for everyone, but you can apply these principles to find what's the right level of automation for you and your group. Once again, I hope that you found this helpful. If you have questions about automation or anything you need to troubleshoot, let us know. Feel free to stop by the Discord. Additionally, you can check out Tim Posney's Discord and the Chris's pre-made Discord in the description below. Lots of helpful folks in all three of these communities, some with more specific expertise than others, but all fantastic resources to go check out if you need additional help. If you're interested in learning more about any of the modules we've covered specifically, we've also got a playlist for module showcases and module tutorials that may be of interest to you. Again, this has been Zephyr with the BailiWiki channel. If you enjoyed this video, then subscribe to keep up with all of our latest videos and consider becoming a patron. Not only do you support the channel, but you also gain access to all the modular systems and scenes that we've ever made, including all of these brand new maps that are out today for Foundry VTT. Again, it's been Zephyr. Thank you so much for watching. Happy gaming and have a good one.